just to bring people up to speed a, a bit further with regards to Dr. Gundry's um, sort of thesis or my understanding of his thesis, and I hope that I'm representing it accurately, is that while plants, those foods I listed before, like legumes and whole grains and nuts and seeds, that whilst they contain beneficial compounds, they also contain toxins, notably lectins, that can negatively affect your health. And that's that's the paradox, hence the name plant paradox. And Dr. Gundry, he, he speaks of a variety of different kind of quote-unquote toxins as he labels it, but really focuses most on lectins. And as I said, he believes they explain the majority of diseases in the Western world. And his solution is to avoid the most lectin-rich foods, properly prepare the foods from his very short list of plant foods that are safe to eat, and then to shield yourself from any lectins that inevitably find their way into your mouth with his lectin shield supplement. What's your immediate reaction to this thesis? There's a really, I mean, I, I like the way, Simon, that you kind of laid that out, right? There's a very well-worn path the to, to to kind of claims that we see in the health space broadly nutrition in particular and it starts with the identification of the thing you know in the food we were told to eat for health is actually what you want to avoid so we were told to eat x this is why you should eat y the specifics of that claim can change from quack to quack but that's the core genesis of it. And then you proceed from there to, you know, whatever shreds of evidence they can use to build up that claim. And then, of course, this thing in food that we were told to eat, but we shouldn't, is also the quote-unquote root cause. And so it's not that it's necessarily specific to any condition. It's, in fact, a uniform explanation for all conditions. And you can achieve health by removing this thing and also purchasing an $80 supplement. And it's just, it's such a, it's such an incredible blueprint, right? As a template, you know, we, we could sit here now and come up with the next one if we just thought long and hard enough about something in food. <laughs> um, and so, and yet, and yet, I mean, I know we can laugh at it, but yet this type of sequential narrative is incredibly persuasive to people. Um, especially, and here's the thing I would, uh, I guess, to 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 slightly um, be fair to particularly people with gastrointestinal issues, irritable bowel syndrome or otherwise, there's a lot of gaps in knowledge that we have. The difference between people that are trying to at least adhere to a scientific way of thinking about it is we don't just fill in the gaps with whatever uh, mechanistic speculation or otherwise. And unfortunately, the gaps are often manipulated by someone like a Stephen Gundry to mount a specific claim. And that can be incredibly persuasive to people. If you're someone who has, you know, uh, symptoms and you're not really getting any resolution from the generic kind of advice you might get, or even from a frontline or sorry, second line intervention like a low FAPMAP diet, uh, and then where do you go? And of course, this is where claims like this made by someone with a degree of authority bias can become incredibly persuasive for people. Um, so there is a challenge there in terms of trying to balance what we know with what gaps may exist. Um, but yeah, I think when you when you describe Stephen Gundry's claims like that, it's just it's this same narrative. He could be talking about lectins. He could be talking about some other, quote, anti-nutrient could be talking about sugar and carbohydrate generally, like Gary Taubes. It's a singular unifying theme that provides a broad explanation for every condition we have, and they offer solutions to that. I might be skipping forward a little bit here because we're yet to dig into his claims, but I think it's, it's important to kind of hit up the top here as well. Is it possible that Dr. Gundry's thesis, his position is wrong, but someone could read his book, 
make the changes he recommends and feels better? Oh, I would say, of, of course. I mean, you never know. For, for each individual, they might have difficulty with certain foods. Um, there are certain intolerances. There are food allergies. There are all sorts of reasons that someone could react negatively to a specific food. And by eliminating this broad category of foods, yeah, there's a chance that you hit that problematic food or, or few foods. Um, and so when someone makes those kinds of changes, they feel better. It can be even more convincing to them, you know, versus just just hearing the stories. Um, so yeah, I think it's absolutely possible, but there are better ways to narrow in on what the problem is without eliminating all of these what are really healthy foods. Um, yeah, which I think could have a you know negative consequences down the road. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if we if we take for example, let, let's take a food we'll probably discuss several times today is like beans generally or red kidney beans to be very specific. And we know, for example, if we're characterizing uh, individuals with IBS compared to non-IBS controls, one of the characteristics is hypersensitivity to distension. There's the same amount of hydrogen produced as a byproduct of fermentation of non-digestible carbohydrates but there's hypersensitivity in some individuals compared to others. So absolutely, it's possible that as a byproduct of a food, fiber-rich, that there is this effect. And so they, so so what you know, and it's really important because what's Matt, what Matt's describing is important. It's correctly identifying what may be at play and why, rather than people getting sold down. Oh, it's it's for the wrong reasons that they're then going on what could be. A very exclusionary diet for for the wrong reasons, and then paying eighty bucks for a supplement, <laughs> and then paying eighty bucks for lectin shield. <laughs> yes. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Yeah. I mean, just to reiterate what you said, Alan, it is, it is, it's a playbook. Step one, everything you've been told, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And then once, once you hear that, you're, you're waiting to be told, well, what, what is actually to blame? <laughs> so that's step two. You know, now that we've established that, that let's introduce something else to blame for poor health. And then step three, let's sell you some type of solution. Uh, so, the claims that I that I want to kind of zoom in on here are number one, and we've kind of hit this, but everything you've been taught about diet and your health is wrong. Um, number two that I see come up quite a bit is lectins cause leaky gut. Number three, which is somewhat uh, related to number two, lectins cause inflammation, or is often related within the same story that there's damage to the gut lining, increased intestinal permeability, and subsequently infl inflammation. Number four, again, somewhat related to number two and three, lectins cause uh, autoimmune conditions or can worsen them, and avoiding lectins has been shown to cure autoimmune conditions. And number five, lectins cause weight gain. Just to kind of close the loop on number one, the everything you've been taught about diet and your health is wrong. I I thought it was interesting that in his in his book Plant Paradox he says that in the introduction, but then in chapter one he kicks it off saying eating shellfish and egg yolks dramatically reduces cholesterol. As I said in the introduction, forget everything you thought you knew was true. So what what I take from this is he's saying that dietary cholesterol reduces serum cholesterol and the you know forget the guidelines that have kind of recommended people limit dietary cholesterol over over the years and there's some nuance in, in that and that's kind of irrelevant here but he's he's sort of making the claim that these foods rich in dietary cholesterol dramatically reduce cholesterol and all you have to do is look at that first reference and, 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 and see that it was a clinical trial that 
looked at a group of, of healthy um, normal lipidemic men, so their their cholesterol levels were normal, and they had a diet rich in saturated fat and animal protein, and then they had some people swap some of that animal protein rich in saturated fat for shellfish, and of course their cholesterol serum cholesterol went down. They were eating much less saturated fat and more polyunsaturated fats. But Dr. Gundry here is kind of attributing that reduction in serum cholesterol to the cholesterol in shellfish, and he's kind of tacked on egg yolks there. Um, so he's he's kind of doubling down on this idea that you need to rethink what you know, but the problem here is that that study is actually well supported by the dietary guidelines. And the authors in that paper say that the reduction in cholesterol that these subjects eating shellfish is explained by a reduction in saturated fat and an increase in polyunsaturated fats. You know, so not that you would expect the average reader to kind of go into that first study, but if someone did, you can kind of already begin to see how this book is going to play out. Uh, I wonder if we can give people a heuristic to work with for these kind of claims, when you see a book written by some someone MD that launches with everything you know about nutrition is wrong, a good heuristic for people to maybe think about is actually that's like a dog whistle for everything this person's going to say is likely going to be wrong. <laughs> it's this person's not, going to probably not this, far off. <laughs> This person's guaranteed to get the interpretations wrong. <laughs> and if we double click on that further here, Alan, uh, you know, taking the position that the 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 dietary guidelines is wrong and that there's some other explanation, maybe you can walk us back through some some of the data and it can be high level, but there is evidence that suggests you know, if people are moved more towards dietary guidelines. I know there was that study looking at the UK dietary guidelines that this does improve either biomarkers or health outcomes. Yeah, like we, we, we can think pretty pretty high level for this one, right? This claim, everything you know about nutrition is wrong or everything the research or the science tells us is wrong is so demonstrably false. And it's it generally at best relied on either in that case a complete misinterpretation so it's not even an accurate example or it's relied on for example you can see certain authors will still say well because dairy fats may behave slightly differently in these controlled studies on blood lipids our dietary guidelines for saturated fat as a broad group are wrong so it's either based on misinterpreted data gross over extrapolations and generalizations. And actually, I think people miss these broad, multiple examples of where nutrition science produced evidence from epidemiology that ended up congruent with uh, intervention trials in some cases or mechanistic work in others. So we have the example of you know, folic acid and neural tube defects, originally identified in case control studies, confirmed in some prospective studies, confirmed in randomized control trials. Uh, we have the example of trans fats in the food supply. We didn't even need an RCT to, to show that, although you could retrospectively attribute metabolic ward research that looked at partially hydrogenated fats, and you could, you could link using the same food, for example, ground nut oil, and you could see in its natural form as an unsaturated fat-rich oil, lower levels of cholesterol, but in the partially hydrogenated version, cholesterol going through the roof. So across multiple domains or multiple isolated examples, we have seen nutrition science produce successful interventions for the public health. And then that's a kind of specific nutrient level examples. At the kind of broader level of a dietary pattern, most of our knowledge has been distilled into general guidelines. They appear slightly differently from nation to nation uh, at a national level in terms of specifics or even how they're presented graphically or the, the specifics of the recommendations in terms of some foods. 
but broadly speaking as characteristics of diet, they're relatively uniform in suggesting that saturated fats are lowered and replaced with unsaturated fats and complex carbohydrates are preferred over refined. Um, fruits and vegetables are consumed, you know, at least five a day, which is the compromise because ideally it would be higher, but we need to be realistic with public health recommendations. And whether you're looking at WHO recommendations, which they did in the UK Biobank cohort, so international guidelines, or you look at UK national guidelines and adherence within a population, or you look at adherence to the Nordic Nutrition Councils as they've done in the Denmark Copenhagen study, and they've done in a couple of other uh, Scandinavian cohorts, or you look at adherence to the US dietary guidelines. Whatever national level adherence you're looking at, you will see that compared to lower adherence, higher adherence is associated with lower risk of mortality outcomes, cardiometabolic disease in particular, which we're primarily concerned with. So the the just as a just as a testable proposition, everything we know about nutrition is wrong. If we treat that as an empirical statement rather than just a, a kind of marketing tool, it's demonstrably falsifiable whether we're talking about dietary patterns or even whether we're talking about some of the specific nutrient examples, which I think are are great success stories of nutrition science. Something else that has just popped popped uh, in mind is so Gundry's creating this this kind of scenario where he's he's telling you what you've been told is wrong and he's about to shift the blame to something else, lectins. And part of that story is that these, as I mentioned earlier, these lectin-containing foods are things like legumes and, and whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Do we know much about the lectin content of the typical diet? Because at face value, it seems it, it seems difficult to blame foods that the average person is probably not eating a lot of based on what typical diets look like in Western countries. I mean, I think that's a, a fair point too, especially when you consider... And the majority of calories coming from ultra processed foods in America, for example, um, they tend to have lower lectin content than, I mean, Gundry himself put out a video about white rice versus brown rice saying, when you remove the germ, you're removing the lectins. And so I, I, I'm not sure if that sort of analysis has been done. I honestly don't see the importance of doing that type of analysis, but I wouldn't be surprised if the lectin content is much lower um, uh, than what he may be suggesting. Um, you know, even if it's not overtly, but, uh, going back to something that, that Alan said too, I just wanted to touch on was when you look at, um, like healthy eating index scores, for example, so, so people's diets can be scored according to how closely they are, you know, fitting the, the dietary guidelines. Um, you see that there's roughly a 20% lower risk of all cause mortality with those following the guidelines more closely or the high, higher health eating at X score. So um, that's sort of what we have to zoom back out to, like, like Alan suggested, just looking at the outcomes and looking at what happens to people when they actually follow these. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question about the lectin content of the diet, I'm not sure. It's probably lower than, than would be suggested. But, uh, but even to that, Matt, what would be, what would be interesting is if you're, so, for example, if we're thinking about the actual foods that are claimed, well, that are actually on, you know, uh, higher in lectins, and you would look at traditional populations, or sorry, populations consuming them as part of a traditional or habitual diet, um, and outcomes in 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 those populations. Now, there's obviously multiple factors that would go into that, but I would I would believe we could formulate a, at least a hypothesis that you know populations consuming diets with more of these foods as part of the habitual diet compared to an average western population and we know what the outcome data for the typical western diet is so the idea that even we could draw a straight line between lectin content of diet in a western context you know, knowing that there are diets which would have habitually higher levels of these foods consumed in them. I just even think, I think even as a hypothesis, it's it's riddled with holes already. Mm -hmm.